Hey, everybody, welcome again to another episode of the Shop Notes podcast. I'm your host, Phil Huber. Today, John is out on assignment, actually vacation. And it's just Logan and I today for a workshop podcast. I uh, want to say a special shout out. Today is episode 199. So we're closing in next week, 200. So thank you to our sponsor for today's episode. You want a glue that you can trust. And fortunately, Tightbond has the glue you need to get the job done with confidence. From interior glues with strong initial tack and short clamp time to exterior glues with exceptional strength and water resistance, look to Tightbond, the right glue for your next project. For more information, visit Tightbond.com. Dot com. You want me to read some? Read some comments? Because we had Dylan I on. I sure can. Yep. And then we were talking about, uh, I think it was based on the, the previous conversation where we had with you and John and I, where we yeah. were looking at both uh, Panto Router yeah. and Shaper Origin. Yep. All right. Uh, at Jeff Baker, 8808 says, I have to agree that given the choice between Panto Router and Shaper Origin, I would choose the Domino and Shaper Origin. I've used the Domino, and it is legendary, as you know, for making fast, strong joints with easier demands for, on preparing the stock. Mind you, it's really easy to make a hole where you don't want one. Yes, I know. I did that. <laughs> um, uh, and he also said that uh, having been inspired by the CNC base camp series that Chris does, uh, I've been I powered up the little dormant CNC machine in the studio that I'm in, he's a member at. Um, he said the possibilities open up even more immensely with the power of CAD CAM mixed together with a router, aka Shaper Origin. Next one. <laughs> Gary. Gary Polak, 1653, says there was a This Old House episode where Norm used a client shopsmith to do all the woodworking for the show. He only did that once, didn't he, Gary? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to get the, <laughs> the shopsmith people all riled up. Uh, Walter Riggs says I'd get the Shaper Origin over the Panto. Uh, I'll. I've ever seen done with the Panto is mortars and tenon, and I have a table saw, hand drills, drills, and chisels for that, whereas the Shaper Origin is portable CNC. Tough to do CNC stuff with anything else. It is. Um, if you've only seen the Panto do mortars and tenons, then you need to find somebody that's better on the Panto router. Uh, I own a Shaper Origin and a Domino. Use the heck out of both of them. Uh, this is from at Pangle 200. Uh, between them, I can either batch out production parts, the domino, or set up and execute special journey for a one-off project with Shaper. Uh, the deep dive on the Panther router with uh, Ramon Valdez at AWFS last year. Um, he was in the Panther router booth um, and determined that it would probably be redundant for me and probably wouldn't use it or invest the time to master its array of use cases. He said if he was using, if he was running a production shop, I'd go to the Panther router over a Shaper for joinery. But I'd probably also have a Shaper around for templates, inlays, weird shapes, etc. Um, he does say, caveat, I'm an avid user of SketchUp and a pretty good user of Fusion 360. Weird flex, bro. Uh, so using the Shaper's a breeze, um, if I was making the same choice for my non-production shop, but didn't have 3D modeling skills, I'd probably go Panther Router. That's this guy right here. Uh, I know how to use the Panther Router, but my 3D modeling skills are lacking. Um, see, I think this this is, in my opinion, the um, this is the comment that hits that follows my thought the most. Uh, at TG Atkins. At, Akins says, as cool as both the Panther router and Shaper are, I think they're they do different enough things that it's hard to compare their usefulness for in someone's shop unless that person does the things that these tools are best suited for. As a hobbyist without any experience with the tools, the Panther router looks to be geared towards accuracy and reproducing results in a manufacturing sense. The Shaper can achieve repeatability, but also is excellent at prototyping and doing something once that won't need to be produced efficiently over and over. For me, doing one-offs mostly, the shaper is a tool I'm likely to pick up at this point. 
See, I agree with this um, from a from his his standpoint as far as the Panther Rider is definitely more of a production thing. I don't think there, there's a reason you don't see Shaper Origin in you know you don't see a fleet of sixty of them in a cabinet shop because that's not what it's designed for. Right. Um, so, and for myself, you know, with both a an Origin here and a Panther Router here. Um, the Panther router suits the projects I build much more uh, efficiently in my mind. But as TG Aiken says, the origin is much more adept at doing like patterns and templates and stuff that I can easily translate from the computer to a file. Um, that's where I lean on it. Um, and then at Jim Carroll 1005 says, how would Logan compare the Panther router and the shipper origin with the Lee FMT pro? Now I have zero. That's actually a really good point because I'm getting ready to do this joinery machine article. And I don't know if the, uh, Lee FMT pro falls into that, but, um, I think the, the FMT, if I remember correctly, is really a mortise and tendon type tool. Yeah. So I mean, it is template comparing. It is template based in this in a similar way to the Panto. Yeah. Right? Yes. Um. But let me see. Let me take a look at the see Rockler sells it as the Lee FMT Pro mortise and tenon jig. So I don't know. So there are square tenon guides, mortise guides, leg, uh, joint guides. I don't know what joint guides are. Um, square tenon guides, Y-axis mortise guides. So there are, I mean, there are different guides available. Um, to me, this is much closer to something like one of our shop-made yeah. mortising jigs. I would agree. Then... Yeah, then then like the the Panther router or the Shaper Origin. I think they're just they're too different. I don't think you can compare them. Now, can you do everything on the Panto or can you do everything that the Panto router can do with a Shaper Origin? Yes. I think if you are how I would work, which is napkin math napkin sketches right i know where a mortise needs to go and i don't need to draw it in you know a cad program or whatever then the side by side the panther router is significantly faster than the origin now right with that said i think i i think um i have a handful of projects here in the shop that are getting wrapped up and are going to get started. Um, one of them is going to be an outfeed, a new outfeed table for my table saw. Um, I'm going to build in like the, um, the shaper workstation into that. Okay. So like there will be a designated area for the origin to, to run. And I think bringing in that workstation really will speed up some of that stuff, especially if you have like, you know, a, a batch of, uh, standard size mortises and tenons inside of the the um, in the in the shaper. So then you can quickly do that type of stuff. Um, however, I think the Panther router is still faster for the way I work. Um, Origin certainly has a, a place. Um, I have a call in an hour with uh, shaper um, talking about an article I'm doing. I'm going to do an article on uh, doing inlays with the Origin. Um, because I have to do one and that's how I'm able to do it. <laughs> so that's, uh, you know, it's like that instance. I can't, can't use anything else I have for that other than hand doing it, which I don't want to. Right. So, right. You know, it's, yeah. Yeah. And there were several comments. I even got an email comment, which I don't have here in my, in my shop, um, about, you know, that the origin and the Panto router are two different animals so that you can't really compare them. They are. And I get that, but I think that makes the comparison 
in my mind, which is why we brought it up, even more valid. Because otherwise, if you go Panto router, you know, if you're trying to find like a, you know, a like comparison, then you're doing the Panto router to like the, to a router jig or a hollow chisel mortiser or, or domino or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, and then it just yeah. becomes like a flavor preference of ice cream, you know, which is not mm. what I was looking for. I was looking for a, an apples to orangutans, you know, comparison, because yep. then it speaks to the type of work that you do. You know, do you do a lot of heavy joinery work where that's the focus? Then, you know, then maybe Panto router is what you do. Like all of our... A lot of people as a furniture makers for woodworkers do a lot of joinery. So is a tool like a Panto router appealing to you in spite of your other options for creating those joints? Or is the kind of CNC capabilities that the Origin offers, does that hold more appeal? Because it's maybe something you don't have either tooling or skills to do already. Like you had mentioned with inlay. Yeah. Yeah. And I think somebody made a good point on those YouTube comments where they're talking about one off and unique stuff. Right. Like you, you could certainly rig up jigs and, and innovative ways to hold stuff on the Panther router. Um, you definitely can. Um, inherently it's designed for like flat type parts, but some of the stuff that I've seen Mac and John Henry do on it, it you know, and, and, uh, Ramon Valdez, some of that stuff's crazy. Yeah. Um, where it's like, wow, like you're building jigs on top of it to hold parts at certain angles and stuff. Like you can definitely do it, but if you're doing like, <laughs> if you're doing more like, you know, artsy fartsy gallery work where joineries at weird angles, you're never going to reproduce that thing again. You know, somebody brought that up. Origin, I think makes a lot of sense. Right. Um, you know, and, and bringing like, if you bring in, you know, like a, a Festool Domino and that Lee FMT jig into it, you know, those, those two are much closer. I think together, the, the Festool and the Lee jig, than they are to the other two. Um, just, just different. Right. Um, yeah. Because those are you know, primarily I I, a mortise and tenon or a loose tenon joinery. Setup. Yeah. That's what you're, that's what you're there for. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think really the only, com the only machine that is close to the Panther router is the multi-router. Right. Um, it was JDS multi-router. Now Woodpeckers owns it and manufactures it. Um, and Woodpeckers actually made a few improvements to it right. um, from from JDS. Uh, so there, uh, there's a reason you see those in cabinet shops. You know, right. there are many cabinet shops that have multi-router. There are many shops that have panto routers. Um, there are many shops that have been asking uh, panto router to make an industrial version for like higher production. And I think, I think they were working on that. I don't know where that's going right now, okay. um, but like a heavier duty version. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. It's, it's interesting. They're just, they're different. And you, I don't think you get, you need to buy one of each, you know, just to make everybody <laughs> happy. You need to buy one of each. Yeah. Yeah. Again, which is where I wanted to ask that question is because both of those are pricey investments. So if you're yeah. if you're going to make that kind of an investment, there is an inherent bias in choosing one over the other because of what what they do. You know, you're looking for Yeah, oh yeah, for, for sure. this compared to that. So, yeah, I mean between yeah, between like Origin, multi router, Panther router, you know, they're all right in that three thousand dollar range, maybe a hair more. Yeah. Um, you know, they're they're expensive, um, but so is a lathe, so is a table saw, so is right. you know, a good drill press, you yeah, know, like a solid like bandsaw, you know, that's all. Yeah, yeah. Nobody nobody got into woodworking to save money, right? <laughs> 
I got into it to save money and waste time. That's right. <laughs> so yeah. there you go. Yeah, it's it's an interesting conversation, and it'll be kind of kind of fun. We have at our fall event that we have coming up. Uh, Amanda Russell, I believe, is going to be talking about kind of the pros and cons of of each of those, and kind of running through her experience yeah. with them. So, and she has got some. She, she, she's got some extensive. She's very good with each one. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Which is yeah. funny because you usually find, I mean, you know, which we could totally put up an octagon and have some kind of a cage match between, you know, origin folk and panto router folk. But to have somebody that can do both competently and expertly, you know, I think is mm-hmm. super valuable, too. So. Yep. So there you go. So you were in mm-hmm. Texas last week. I was. I was uh, speaking of uh, Amanda Russell. I was down at her old stomping grounds at the Austin School of Furniture um, in Austin with Austin Waldo. Um, it gets very confusing. Sure. Sure. Um, shooting uh, a project, um, little kind of side table ish, um, interesting design. Uh, we used, we, we actually used the Panto router for the joinery on it, um, which was pretty cool. Um, they have, they have several Panto routers down there on the original design that Austin, Austin had built a few of these for like gallery pieces. Um, he simplified the design a little bit for the magazine article. Um, in the original, uh, he had also brought in the, uh, shaper origin to do some cutouts on the tops of the legs. Um, but we, we simplified it a little bit. Um, very cool. Uh, I will say for all of our Texas folk, I do not like Texas. I am so sorry. Um, (laughs) I, it's so hot, so humid and oddly dry at the same time. It just is like, man, um, my wife grew up down there. So like, I get it. Uh, but and I, I do understand that Texas is a very big state, so there's different parts of Texas. Um, I don't like the Austin area. It was it was hot. It was a long trip to get back. Um, but yeah, it was it, it was a good trip um, between getting to to. Uh, I was there Wednesday through Friday, um, so Wednesday evening I dropped off all my camera gear, and then there was a, cl- a night class. Uh, they do a seven week class where it's like one, I think one night a week for seven weeks. Maybe it's every night for seven weeks. I don't remember. Anyways, um, but they were in there working. So they were working on some, like uh, one of the projects is like a pair of Kronov style sawhorses. Okay. So they were working on those. Um, very cool to see um, the demographics in that class. Um, the class is maybe a 12 people and there was like four or five women in there, which was really cool to see. Um so I took some photos while that class was working that evening. And then Austin and I picked up the the shoots the next day. Um, they are, I don't know how I ended up at a bunch of schools recently, but um, they are, they should be receiving their 503 C designation here in the next month. And once they do that, they're going to start looking for a larger facility than okay. what they're in right now. So um a lot of people may know or may have heard of the Texas Woodworking Festival that happens in November. Um, it is the Austin School of Furniture and Austin Waldo that put that together. Um, we are sponsors of that. We being um, Fine Woodworking, Active Interest Media, are sponsors. So uh, if you're around the area or want to take a trip to Austin, it's a beautiful city, you know, contrary to what I just said. <laughs> Uh, it would be a very cool, I, I, I'm strongly considering going back down there for the, for the festival in, uh, November. So we'll see. Okay. But yeah, it was, it was cool. This episode of the shop notes podcast is brought to you by Grizzly industrial purveyors of fine woodworking machinery since 1983 Buy direct and save at grizzly.com. I'm sure people are like, hey, Logan, nobody's asking this, but hey, Logan, how's that miter saw station you've been working on for three months coming right. along? I've been on the road so much, I just haven't unpacked my can. Like, it's like I get home, then I have like three or four days before I take off again. So it's like I don't want to unpack and set up all the camera gear just to pack it all back up. So 
that project's kind of been on hold and I was working like an issue ahead of the magazine. Now I'm like on the heels of the magazine. <laughs> so as soon as I get back on Monday, man, I am, cause I'm taking off tomorrow. Um, I'm, I gotta get this minor saw station finished up. All right. So I got a lot of, I got a lot of drawers to build. Okay. So luckily, luckily locking rabbits, all the drawers are the same size. There are, there are moments in my life where I have good ideas and I have a spark of brilliance. One of those sparks is making every drawer the same size <laughs> because then it's like, Hey, I can batch out. Like what do I got? Two, four, six, eight, ten 10 drawers to make. If they're all exactly the same. Okay. So cut, every, cut all the parts, throw a dado blade in and go to town. All right. Well, there you go. Yeah. So, all right. So between and in between, I mean, I, oh, as I say, I, I've my filler project has been working on my office. So hmm. I've been spraying paint and drywall. Freaking hate drywall. Oh, so you got to the paint stage in there, huh? Oh yeah, oh yeah. I got two coats of paint on there. All right. Um, but but I'm like I'm at the I'm at the point which is gonna be really nice, and everybody will see the office then because I'll start moving my podcasting station into there. Uh, but like, I'm at the point where I had, I spent a lot of time doing the drywall mainly cause I'm really bad at it. Uh, so it took like tell me way more. more layers than it should have. Right. It's structural uh, drywall. Mostly the mud is structural. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's like, it's basically plaster. Like I would have been better <laughs> off just doing lath and plaster in there. Um, but I got to the point where I put two layers of uh, PVA drywall sealer, right? So it's PVA. It's meant to seal the porous drywall. Sure. I'm like, you know what? Like two layers of this PVA drywall product looks pretty good. Like, I don't know if I even need to paint it. So I don't, I'm trying to do a little bit of research. Like, can I use PVA drywall primer as a final top coat? Because... I was honestly just going to do like a eggshell white or, you know, semi off white color in there just to make it bright. Mm. Um, that's basically what this PVA primer is. Right. Why couldn't you? I don't see a reason why not. I mean, it's. Um, oh, uh, from what I was reading, PVA primer is fairly porous. Okay. So like. If it gets water or you ding it with something, it will scuff really easily. Oh, okay. It's an office. Like, it's an office. And that's what my wife, she's like, you spend a lot of time drawing on there. It's an office in the shop. Like, come on. <laughs> I'm like, fair. Like, that is fair. Yeah. 100%. So. Okay. Yeah. So we'll see. Yep. We'll see. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I might. I, I mean,. At this point, it's like I don't want to spend. Good paint's expensive. Oh yeah. Like I, I will say though, like if I've learned anything in my thirty-five years on this earth, it's like spend good money on toilet paper and paint. Like those are the two things you don't want to go budget on, because I at one point doing the beehives, I bought some budget paint from Menards. It was outdoor paint, and it was like barn. It was like called barn red outdoor paint, and that should have been my. Should have been the, the, uh, the hint that it was not good, um, and it was eleven eleven dollars for a gallon of it, and it was basically Kool Aid. <laughs> it was it was like a red wash. Um, so it's like if I buy paint for in there, you know, you're looking at like sixty bucks a gallon for a good quality like Diamond Vogel paint. Right. Again, it's again, it's it's a shop office, so. Yeah, and it's not got to temper what I'm doing. It's also not a huge space either, so it's not like you're going to need a lot. No, but no, I think because I'm using my airless sprayer, I think I would need two gallons to do it. Oh yeah, I think so. Um, I have the five gallon primer, I put two coats on, and I used all five gallons. Okay, there's 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 maybe a gallon left in the bottom. Okay, so. But you're getting there. That's the main point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I am. Um, yeah, we're, we're getting there. Which will be really nice to be able to move like computer and my desk and everything. Oh, sure. 
Then my wife gets her office back downstairs. She wants to rearrange it. Okay. Which is why I've not built doors and drawers for that office for four years. Is that why you've done done it? Is because she wants to rearrange it? Yeah. Okay. Yes. I knew I knew stuff was going to change. Yeah. Smart man. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. I know. (laughs) Okay. Cool. Well, that'll be fun. Yeah. Let's see. We're wrapping up TV show here. So we got mm-hmm. basically just, uh, we got the gristle left on a couple of episodes just to shoot. And then one, uh, sideboard episode to shoot. And then we'll be done with season 18. Send that off. And then that'll start. Yeah. Start airing in September, which would be kind of cool. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I feel I always feel like our seasons when we shoot them either go I always feel like they go really fast. Like holy cow, we're done with the season already, then I'm like, oh god, we've been shooting that for like nine months. Right. Yeah. That's the thing, because we did start shooting so. it what last late October or November or something like that. Yeah. And I think just because, you know, the way our work schedules are because we're shooting it in between all the other stuff or woven in all the other stuff. So <laughs> yeah. it feels like it just drags yeah. out when it doesn't, I mean, it goes by pretty quickly, the f- actual filming part of it, but yeah, you're yeah. right. It's just like, boy, we're not done with that yet. Yeah. So. so I'm in the, I'm in the stage of reviewing all the episodes as they come in and sometimes they're a little bit long and we got to cut them down and, Mm-hmm. Then you get to watch yourself on camera yeah. a lot. It's not. It's not pretty. I hate that. I will. I will say. I don't know if you feel the same way, but there are times where, like we're like we are starting to really ramp up the video we're doing for Popwood. Yeah, um, we're doing some sponsored video. We're doing some non-sponsored video. Um, we're, we're shooting a lot more than we have in the past five years probably right and both you and i have a lot of crap going on so i don't always review the videos when they're done i mean i rely on our you know nate our video editor is fantastic he knows what he's doing if we need if he needs something from us he'll let us know or if there's something we need to look at he lets us know so a lot of the times the video gets edited from nate he goes over to my designer Uh, this is on the pop wood side and she puts in graphics, um, music, and then um, Colin, our, my digital editor, he he gets it uploaded and stuff. So there's a lot of times I shoot a video and I'll forget about it until I see it pop up on YouTube. <laughs> I'm like, oh hey, I never, I never actually like. Wa- I should watch that video and make sure I'm okay with it before it's out there in the world. And I'll watch it. Like my wife caught me doing this yesterday with the wet turning. We did a wet turning video uh, microwaving bowls and stuff oh yeah i hadn't actually watched it so like there's sometimes i'm watching i'm like man that turned out really nice like it's like we know what we're doing (laughs) there's also sometimes we're like wow i sound like an idiot (laughs) but you know it is what it is we put it all out there they there are different types of videos and they serve different purposes so it's yeah Tough to separate that sometimes. Yeah. I mean, like, and I think both you and I, we both have done sponsored videos. And I, I think this goes for most people. There are some people I see do sponsored videos. They're they're generally considered content creators. So that's what they're doing for a living. So, like, you know, they don't mind selling themselves out a little bit um, because they have to pay their bills. But, like, we will do sponsored content. Um but I think we both do a good job of trying to keep it educational. Like we're not salesmen. We're never trying to pitch something right. to somebody. Yeah. I won't do a, I won't, I won't do a sponsored video on a product. That's not good. Um, yeah. Just won't do it. Like if, if it's there, there are videos where we'll do, we'll do videos on products. that's like, eh, I don't know if I would use this in my shop, but it's still a good product. And I'm not using it because I do something this way instead of this way. Right. Um, but we at least try to make them educational. So when those sponsored videos pop up, it's like, hey, you know, 
this is XYZ tool. This is how it helps doing this process in your shop. But here's two other ways to do it as well. So it's it's interesting because, you know, I had a I had a call yesterday with a, a advertiser that wants to do some sponsored content. And we're talking about, you know, the video is on why you would use this adhesive or when would you use this adhesive versus using these adhesives? Um, so trying to m at least make the content educational where somebody's going to learn something or pick up a tip or trick out of it right. versus just saying, Hey, you need to buy this epoxy. It's like, no, you, no don't. you don't like you can, you, you can use any epoxy. It's just, here's the reasons you'd use an epoxy versus right. not For, right. Yeah. So to t yeah, that's what I always try and do. And when we're in those early calls and meetings is, you know, explain the fact that if somebody is going to watch this video and they're not going to buy the product, I want them still to have gotten something from it. 100%. Yep. And that's always what I said. I always want people to watch to the end, even if they're not interested in buying the product. Yeah. Speaking of videos, we've also been doing more. Uh, one of the things that we've been doing since a AIM acquired Taunton Press is more uh, online courses. Yeah. Because I've seen that Popular Woodworking has some more courses up. We're relaunching a few of the online courses. And I know that we've done a few uh, that we're putting out as new courses. And then uh, Chris and I are each shooting one later this year. So I think that's kind of a cool way to do it too. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I think, you know, Popwood, we had this huge video library. Um, we had over a thousand videos on one of our websites. Um, it was, they were all Popwood content. Yeah. But because we had acquired, because we had acquired the Popwood title through bankruptcy auction, we had no copies of any of the contracts for those, uh, the talent on the video. So we didn't want to be selling video and shortchanging somebody that had a contract with F and W, even though technically from the bankruptcy auction, we're not tied to that contract. Right. We still wanted to take care of people. So yeah. when we, when we started working with the, the team over at fine woodworking, cause they, they sold a lot of online courses. Um, we've started to renegotiate not, I mean, not renegotiate, but we've started to bring those contracts back to, to make sure that those contributing right or the contributing writers contributing um, video talents are taken care of and they're getting paid for their work that they did years ago. Um, and we're relaunching them and they're doing, they're doing really well. I mean, the content, the content's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, we've done a bunch of Chris Shores videos. Um, we have some Wilbur Pan videos coming out. Um, we did the Jimmy clues one that we, we did a couple of years ago internally. Um, so they're, they're really for, for what I think I, I think our marketing team is selling them too cheap <laughs> for what they are, but they know what, they know what price they want to, put stuff at right um uh, because some of them are like four five six hours long oh wow yeah uh yeah they're, they're like they're they're huge like they were big productions so that's cool yeah they're pretty cool yeah we've had a few uh quite a number of video projects uh very similar to the show yep. but usually on the video yep. projects we're able to go into a little bit more actually quite a bit more detail and yep. they were I don't know, just kind of lost in the internets a little bit. So we we put we packaged them up as online courses and have plans to go with it and all that kind of stuff. So that's that's kind of fun. And then I'm doing one on uh, power tool joinery later this year. Okay. Dowels, splines, biscuits, loose tenons, dominoes. That, that's the focus on all that the one. things. Yeah. So more like ones that have like a a wood connector of some sort, not anything that's hardware based, like a pocket screws or that kind of thing. But mm -hmm. integral joiner, yeah, 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 that will be cool. What's what, what's Chris doing? Chris and something. CNC Chris based? and Mark are going to tag team building the shop notes CNC, the new one, the two point oh. Oh, 
Oh, yeah. And then yeah. Chris is going to show about uh, wiring it up, bringing your machine to life, and then running through the steps of creating a project. So he's got a couple of small little things cool. that he'll show how to, you know, take that or take any design really and go from, from a digital file to something that's in real life. Nice. Yeah. That'd be cool. That's, you know, that's, that's one of the things I have always thought about would be a good guy. I don't know. Uh, I, I would be interested to hear what everybody thinks about this. Um, both you and I teach for the Des Moines Woodworkers uh, Guild, Phil. Um, and I've done classes for other guilds um, in the Midwest. I always thought it'd be interesting to do like a, and people have done them, but doing like a SketchUp Basics class. Okay. Um, I always thought that'd be cool. But when you do that, I've talked to people that put these on, you get a certain demographic in there that has never really touched a computer before. So how much of it becomes like a, how to use a computer right. <laughs> class or yeah. how much of it's like, Hey, here's actually SketchUp. So I think by, by Chris doing like a build, build a project, we're doing it together. Yep. That is a good way to do it. Um, because my, my thought was always to say, Hey, come with your napkin project and, we'll put it together in the class. Yeah. Um, you know, with, with help. So I think, I think here we're all going to design a bread box in SketchUp. I think that's a, maybe an easier way to do that. Right. Yeah. But, and I, well, to be fair, there are many tutorials on YouTube on SketchUp. Um, Google, I think has produced a lot of them too. So that's good yeah there is quite a bit on there i think you know we had talked about in the past of doing a you know kind of tongue-in-cheek but a little bit as a audience survey of a sawmilling weekend an immersion weekend so to speak mm -hmm. where you learn the whole not really learn but you have an experience of all the different parts on what's it what's involved i think we could do a similar thing with Chris, like a CNC base camp weekend where we could bring in, yeah. bring in folk with their laptops, talk about digital files. Yep. You know, we have probably four ish CNC machines that we could have and yep. be able to talk about all the things that are involved in it. And then by the end, you can walk out the door having actually run a CNC yourself and with a project that you made on there, even if it is relatively small. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. No, that'd be cool. Um, I think, you know, that, that kind of throws back to when we were doing the, we had just kicked them off right before COVID, um, the in-person classes, yeah. you know, I, I like both you and I, I think, really enjoy teaching those types of classes. So, you know, that's something we definitely want to look at again. Right. Yeah. So. But. Yep. Okay, I think that wraps up another episode of the Shop Notes podcast. Special thanks to Tight Bond Glue. I have a bottle of it in my shop right here, Tight Bond 3. That's the one that I use most often. Logan's got a two right there. Yep. Uh, there's a reason why we have it in our shop. It's the one that we count on to do pretty much all of our woodworking. So uh, we've turned to it for years and years, and you should too. There's quite a few different formulations. Do you want something interior uh, with a strong initial tack? you want something outside that's going to stand up to the elements? Tightbond has it. You want to check it out at tightbond.com. Have any questions, comments, or smart remarks about today's show or any of the shows, you can send us an email, woodsmith at woodsmith.com, or leave us a comment in the YouTube section. We've been trying to read them more often on uh, follow-up episodes. Keep the conversation going, much as we did with the Shaper Origin versus Panto Router throwdown that we've been going on for the past couple of weeks. So uh, do you have anything that you want to share about that? Or maybe stand up for the shopsmith. 
we get quite a few people doing that too. So <laughs> uh, there you go. Uh, thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you next week. Bye. <laughs>